If it's Monday, classified controversy, growing frustration inside the White House, even as the Biden administration admits more classified material was found at the president's Delaware home. Plus, rescue workers racing against the clock, searching for survivors after a Russian missile slammed into an apartment building, killing dozens as the U.S. begins expanded combat training for Ukrainian forces. And honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s life and legacy, President Biden marks the moment in Washington after making history at Dr. King's Ebenezer Baptist Church, asking churchgoers, quote, what kind of country do we want to be? Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker. Thank you so much for being with us on this day in which we honor Dr. Martin Luther King. We will have more on his life and legacy throughout the show. But first, we begin with growing frustration from both Democrats and Republicans over the classified documents found at President Biden's home and at his former private office. Inside the White House, three sources familiar with the matter tell NBC News President Biden is particularly upset over what he views as probable sloppiness by aides who packed up his items at the end of the Obama administration. The sources say the president also feels his administration has been cooperative since the documents were first discovered and that the response to this story has not drawn as stark of a contrast between his administration's handling of sensitive government information with that of his predecessor. Now, this comes as over the weekend, the White House revealed five additional pages of classified documents were found at the president's Delaware home, bringing the total number of batches found there to three. And yesterday, Congressman James Comer, new Republican chair of the House Oversight Committee, wrote a letter to White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain demanding visit logs. Listen. What we see with President Biden is there are multiple locations. Uh, we would never have known about the possession of the classified documents were it not for investigative reporting by CBS. The administration hasn't been transparent about what's going on with President Biden's uh, possession of classified documents. And uh, we just want equal treatment here uh, with respect to how both uh, former President Trump and current President Biden are being treated with uh, with the document. Now, the White House said today it doesn't keep visitor logs for the president's Delaware home. Meanwhile, Democratic allies, including some from within the administration, say they're growing frustrated with the White House's response to the story. Here's what Michigan Senator Debbie Stabenow told Chuck just yesterday. Well, it's certainly embarrassing, right? I mean, it's embarrassing that you would find a small number of documents, certainly not on purpose. They don't think it's the right thing. And they have been moving to correct it, working with uh, the Department of Justice, working with everyone involved, with the archives. And so from my perspective, you know, it's one of those moments that obviously they wish hadn't happened. Some pretty strong words there. My colleague, Carol Lee, joins me from outside the White House. Carol, you have been all over this story, including over the weekend. So what has been the White House's response, particularly to this Republican criticism that we heard over the weekend? Well, they're basically saying that, yeah, we want equal treatment, too. And this, in their view, is not equal treatment by Republicans or saying Republicans are being hypocritical by launching investigations into President Biden's handling of classified documents, arguing that this is not what they were doing and, and demanding, particularly, you know, visitor logs potentially from Mar-a-Lago after the former President Donald Trump's handling of classified documents came to light. So they're saying that this is not genuine, that they're playing politics. I can read you part of a statement they decided to release today, Kristen. They said President Biden is doing the right thing and is cooperating fully with a thorough review, but House Republicans are playing politics in a shamelessly hypocritical attempt to attack President Biden. So they're making the case, the White House is, that Republicans have no credibility on this issue. Now, Republicans are saying, look, this is something that is really legitimate, that should be looked into. We keep learning new things every other day it seems. And so they seem determined to press ahead and try to investigate and figure out and put the, uh, what's happened with these classified documents and put the president on the spot about it. And Carol, as you know, as we have been reporting, it's not just Republicans, mm -hmm. it's Democrats as well. How much scrutiny has the administration been facing from fellow Democrats who feel frustrated by the response that they're seeing. They don't feel as though there's been enough transparency and they don't feel as though there's been a forceful enough 
pushback, frankly, from the White House. That's right. And as you know, Kristen, from your own reporting, there is the public facing criticism from Democrats, which is a little slight and, and not necessarily heavy, heavy handed. You played um, Senator Stabenow there talking to Chuck about this, saying it was embarrassing. We've also heard other members of Congress, Democrats, say that they want an intelligence community assessment of whether there was any damage done to national security because these documents were not where they should have been. They're in the pr president's garage and at an office he, he used to use. And we've heard Democrats say things like, you know, this system seems to be broken and we need to scrutinize how presidents and vice presidents pack up and leave office and what happens to those classified documents. That's the public facing point of it. And a lot of Democrats, it's also worth noting, have come out and said, look, the White House is cooperating. They're handling this fine. Behind the scenes, as you know, Democrats are livid about this. Mm. They're very upset about the way the White House has handled this. They feel like they didn't get out in front of it. They made that choice when that first batch came to light in November 2nd. And there's a real frustration that the president seemed to have a lot of momentum, and so did Democrats, and that Republicans were struggling to elect a speaker. And now they find themselves, Democrats and the president, having to answer questions about classified documents and really on defense. All right, Carol Lee, incredible reporting from outside the White House. Thank you so much. Joining me now is a close ally of the president, South Carolina Democrat Congressman Jim Clyburn. Thank you so much for joining me, Congressman. Really appreciate it and appreciate your being here on this Martin Luther King Day. Well, thank you very much for having me. I do want to talk about Dr. Martin Luther King's life and his legacy with you, but I do have to start with this issue surrounding the documents. I, I want to ask you about what you heard from Debbie Stabenow. She called this embarrassing for the White House. Do you agree with her? Do you agree with that assessment? Well, I think that's uh, one way you can assess it. Uh, I understand uh, the president himself uh, is a bit upset with the way it's been handled. And I suspect uh, you're always uncomfortable uh, when something like this were to uh, happen. But uh, I think he handled it the right way. Uh, his people seem uh, to have uh, responded uh, by the book, so to speak. Uh, and of course, uh, you know you don't know how these things occur. Uh, when you're packing up stuff, you leave in the office, you don't do it all yourself, uh, and you have no idea what made get put in boxes, and I doubt very seriously if the president went to go through all those boxes. Uh, I just finished packing up to get out of the whip office. I have not looked in those boxes. I have no idea uh, what the staff may have put in them, and maybe sometime between now uh, and the 12th of never, I'll get a chance to look at them. Well, Congressman, let, let, let me follow up with you on a couple of points that you make there. You say that's one way to put it. What word would you use? Do you think this is embarrassing for the president and for his staff. Well, I think it's uncomfortable. I, I don't know anything to be embarrassed about. Uh, you find uh, documents lying around uh, in some place. You had no idea that they were there. It's uncomfortable, uh, but I wouldn't be embarrassed about it at all. Congressman, have you spoken directly to President Biden about this? No, I have not. Okay, well, what would your message be to him if and when you do speak to him about this? I understand what you're saying. You believe that they handled it by the book. But as you know, the White House has been facing questions day after day, a lot of them that they don't have answers for. Why did the public learn about this nearly two months after the White House was aware? What did the president know? When did the president become aware of these classified documents in his possession? What would your counsel be to the president? It's to be open and honest. Uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, it's very easy to explain uh, that you're moving out of an office uh, and things like this uh, sometimes happen. And just let the uh, investigation uh, go its way. Remember, you've got to demonstrate the intentions here. There's nothing to show that Joe Biden intended to do anything untoward. In fact, they seem to, as I said, follow uh, the protocol in such things as this. And so I wouldn't uh, tell them to, to be anything uh, but open and honest about it. Hey, Congressman, I understand your point that other people, you know, may have packed up these boxes, but this is serious, sensitive material we're talking about. These are the top secrets of the government. So 
are you concerned that, and I understand you're talking about your office and packing that up, but in this case, this was the former vice president and the nation's top secrets. Shouldn't he have been more careful, particularly when he accused his predecessor of being irresponsible for his handling of classified material? Well, well I understand what you're saying. I don't know what, what it was. Uh, in fact, there have been discussions now uh, ever since I've been in the Congress as to whether or not things are being ratcheted up to top secret, which um, uh, may be uh, a bit much. So I have no idea uh, what these documents entail. And I have not seen any reporting that said there was something uh, that could be compromised, uh, compromising to the country. Uh, so I don't know what it is, but I do know uh, the process needs to be looked at. We need to do what we can uh, to make sure that these things stay secret uh, uh, if they are, in fact, uh, secret. Congressman, before we move on to some other topics, very quickly, do you think that the White House has been transparent enough, or do you worry that this, this undercuts uh, President Biden at a, at a critical moment when he's deciding whether to run for re-election? Oh, there's no question. The, 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 the uh, reporting of all this uh, undercuts uh, all of our, uh, our credibility uh, as, as Democrats when it comes to uh, this kind of an issue. Yes, it undercuts it, but the reporting uh, sometimes is a little, little more sensational uh, than it ought to be. I used to be in the business, you know, so I understand that. All right, Congressman, let's move on to the debt ceiling. This is a big issue that uh, all of Washington's going to be facing. The Treasury Secretary saying that the nation could hit its debt limit this week um, with impacts around June. You've been in these fights before, but is this moment different? Could the country actually go over the cliff this time? How worried are you? Well, the first thing I want people to understand, that when you are talking about the debt ceiling, I have two problems with it. Number one, I have been advocating since before I got to Congress, and ever since I've been in the Congress, that that's something we all not have anyway. What other country has got a debt ceiling uh, in uh, that's codified? And I haven't said that. You cannot play Russian roulette with this country's future, this country's credibility, and nothing can ruin credibility of a country quicker than for people not to be able to, to depend upon you to keep your word. Congressman, we have. I want to move on to Dr. Martin Luther King, but very quickly, should Democrats negotiate on this issue, just yes or no? Should there be some concessions we, we made? We always to the negotiate. In a democracy, you always negotiate. Okay. All right. Let's talk about Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, I, you heard President Biden speak today very different and over the weekend, very different message on voting rights, not as fired up as we heard him last year. Why is that? Is that just an admission that with this divided Congress, it's going to be impossible to get something like voting rights legislation done? It's going to be very, very hard to do. I do you wish the president be... was more fired up on the issue, though? Well, no, I think the president is being very calm, presidential, and we are going to do what we think we can get done. Last year this time, people were saying that the Biden administration was not going to get anything through the Congress. And look what we did. And so I think we will get something done on this. There are ways that we can create a better climate in order to get it done. I just believe that the president is doing the right thing. And Congressman, just finally, you grew up in South Carolina during Dr. King's civil rights era. What are your reflections today? Well, today I want to remind people of King's letter from the Birmingham City Jail. In that letter, Dr. King warned us that he had come to the conclusion that the people of ill will in our society was making a much better use of time than the people of goodwill. And he warned us that we are going to be made to repent, not just for the vitriolic words and deeds of bad people, but for the appalling silence of good people. And so I would say on this King Day, looking at recent Supreme Court decisions, looking at legislatures, 49 legislatures over this uh, country uh, has uh, passed uh, suppression laws, 
we must break our silence. And I think that's what the president was talking about today. Silence gives consent. So when you stay silent about these suppression laws, you stay silent about the, the, a woman's right to choose, you are contributing to what's wrong with the country. Congressman Jim Clyburn, we will live it there. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Coming up, relentless rainfall in California breaks records as the already soaked state braces for even more severe weather. Plus, as we honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy, I will speak with historian and founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, Lonnie Bunch. You don't want to miss his reflections. But first, Dr. King appeared on Meet the Press five times during the height of the civil rights movement. Here's a powerful moment from his first appearance on the show in April of 1960. You have yourself have said that the aim of your method of nonviolent resistance is not to defeat or to humiliate the white man, but to win his friendship and understanding. How successful do you think you have been or are being in winning the friendship and understanding of the white men of the South? Well, I should say that this doesn't come overnight. Uh, the nonviolent way does not bring about miracles. Uh, in a few hours, uh, in a few days, or in a few years, for that matter. Uh, I think uh, at first, uh, the first reaction of the oppressor when oppressed people rise up against uh, the system of injustice is an attitude of bitterness. But I do believe that if the nonviolent resistors continue to follow the way of nonviolence, they eventually get over to the hearts and souls of the former oppressors. And I think it eventually brings about that redemption that we, we, we dream of. Of course, uh, I can't estimate how many people we've touched so far. This is impossible because it's an inner process. But I'm sure something is stirring in the minds and the souls of people. And I'm sure that uh, many people are thinking anew on this basic problem of human relations. Welcome back. As we mentioned at the top of the show, there is growing frustration by President Biden as well as his fellow Democrats over the discovery of classified documents at the president's home and former D.C. office. With the president angry with the backlash over the controversy and some Democrats angry over the White House's response to the story. I'm joined now by my panel, co-author of Politico Playbook, Rachel Bade, former Democratic Congresswoman from Maryland, Donna Edwards, and editor and CEO of The Dispatch, Stephen Hayes. He is also an NBC News political analyst. Thanks to all of you for being here on this Monday, this Martin Luther King Day. Rachel, let me start with you and our reporting that the president's frustrated, his allies are frustrated with the response that they're seeing by the White House. What are you hearing? How much of a political firestorm is this within the administration? I mean, look, the whole thing is, is really embarrassing for the president right now. He wants to say, oh, woe is me. Republicans are saying this matters, when for Donald Trump, they said they didn't really care and weren't going to even investigate mm. the fact that he had his own classified documents down at Mar-a-Lago. But it's... <sighs> It looks terrible for him. I mean, he's been out there pointing at Trump, saying he's irresponsible for so long, and he has his own problem here. And I know the White House are trying to be very careful about saying, look, there's a difference between Trump and Biden. Trump had a bunch of documents. Biden only has a few. He didn't cooperate for a long time. We're cooperating. But, like, you know, this is semantics. And for everyday voters across the country who are more worried about inflation, they're, they don't see a difference here. And so it's, it just looks really ugly. It's really the crux of the point, Donna, right, that the, the White House started out and the president, by the way, saw an opportunity to say, hey, here's a, a big distinction between me and my predecessor. And now, as Rachel points out, it's all muddled. Yeah, I think it is really messy. And I think from the White House perspective, they do see the distinctions. And those of us who are paying attention know there are clear distinctions between uh, the Trump documents and the Biden documents. But for the general public, it just all gets conflated. And I think that's frustrating for Republic, uh, for Democrats. But I also think it's uh, frustrating for the White House. And the way to get out from under this um, they can't get in front of it anymore. But the way to get out from under it is to, you know, err on the side of transparency throughout the process. I want to play a clip of a briefing. I'm asking Karine Jean-Pierre some questions. Steve, I'm going to ask you on the other side to get your reaction. 
would the president agree to sit for an on the record in person? Just not, I'm not going to get into specifics or get ahead of what's going to happen. I'm not going to get into hypotheticals because that is a hypothetical. I have you guys have answered questions when the press has broken in the news. Because it's an ongoing process. Because, again, it is an ongoing process. There is a process here. The Department of Justice is independent. We respect that process. Stephen, what do you make of what we're seeing coming out of the White House in terms of communication? Do you think there's going to be a change in strategy? And have Republicans played this right or have they overstepped? Well, I mean, there should be a change of strategy because the strategy they've employed hasn't worked. And it hasn't worked because it's borderline insulting, honestly, to hear her say, we can't put out more information at this point because there's an investigation taking place at the Justice Department. Nobody believes that. I mean, nobody who's listening thinks that that's a serious response. They can put out more information. They ought to put out more information because there's so many questions that we have to ask based on the limited information that they've shared. I would say I think it goes even deeper. I think Rachel's point is a key one. It goes even deeper than the, the differences between the Trump and the Biden documents. Joe Biden ran as somebody who said the rules matter. The, all of these things that Donald Trump has sort of set aside or flouted, I'm going to change that. I'm going to be different. I'm going to return the country and the practice of politics to normal. And this suggests that it was all a campaign term yeah. argument. Uh, and I would say, you know, there's a lot of talk right now at the White House about Republicans being hypocrites. And there's that's absolutely a fair point in that, like, they didn't want to talk about Trump's di by, uh, document issues, but now they want to talk about Biden's. Right. But you could also say the same thing about Democrats. I mean, Clyburn was just on your show saying, mm -hmm. oh, you know, I've got all these boxes. I don't know what's in them. I mean, we can all relate to that. But when it came to Donald Trump and his own document problems at Mar-a-Lago, people were saying, oh, he should be arrested. He broke the law, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're hearing yeah. very different things. You're, you're seeing oversight at its very most political uh, point right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. but let's be really clear. I mean, the distinctions are important. Donald Trump absconded with the documents, refused to comply with even um, the orders for production, yeah. which resulted in a subpoena. That's very, very different from the way the Biden White House has handled this, however messy it is. But I don't think that those of us who are in the press and who are analyzing this um, do a service to the American public by us conflating the two. Very quickly, do you think the president should sit for an interview with a special counsel if, in fact, he is asked? I mean, I was asking that of Kareen, but to this point of transparency, do you think that that's going to be important? Well, I think if he's asked by the special counsel, then I think the White House has, does have some real decisions to make because um, the special counsel is conducting an investigation. The White House has said, and I believe then, that the president wants to cooperate with that investigation. And I think that that would be in the interest of the White House to do that. Stephen, before we move on to the debt limit, because I do want to talk about that. I, I mean, do Republicans run the risk, as Rachel is pointing out, uh, of looking like they are being hypocritical by not uh, investigating the Trump documents issue and going so strongly after. Yeah, after sure. Biden. I mean, they are hypocrites. I mean, there's no <laughs> question that they're being hypocritical. <laughs> I think Republicans are sort of at the point where they don't care if they're hypocrites. I mean, you see them openly making arguments, taking on Joe Biden, criticizing Joe Biden when they've defended something that I think, as Donna points out, I mean, there are pretty important differences here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Republicans have defended President Trump on those. Well, the, the, the standard right. for ethical behavior cannot be the Trump standard. Mm -hmm. And I think that the White House and the president agree with that. And so it's really in, our, in the interest of Democrats to get in front of it. When we think about differences, we are heading into this undoubtedly bruising battle over the debt limit, whether to raise it, how much to raise it. Um, and you have the Treasury Secretary, put, Secretary putting out this pretty stark warning that we're about to go over the cliff with some real impact happening in June. Rachel, do you see a resolution to this. We've seen these battles before. The nation's credit limit was downgraded yeah. during Obama's presidency. I mean, they're going to have to find a way out of this. Otherwise, you know, we could see, you know, a financial recession like we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, the reality is that people are really concerned that we're going to see something worse potentially than just a credit downgrade because Republicans are not bluffing right now. I mean, they are, there are, this faction in the House, because of this very slim margin that McCarthy has and this very sort of weak position he is in as Speaker, you know, he is going to have to do or feels like he has to do whatever his far right flank is telling him to do. And so, you know, Democrats and these moderate Republicans, it's really going to be up to them to lead and try to come together to try to raise the debt ceiling. Are they going to get some, are Republicans going to get something for it? I don't know. The White House is saying they're not going to negotiate mm -hmm. right now. 
But, you know, Republicans did flip the House. And, you know, I was on a panel just yesterday where they were talking about, you know, elections have consequences. So you can't just say, I'm not going to negotiate. You have to get in a room and talk at some point. I do want to end this panel by talking about the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. One of them was... Uh, one of the messages that he had, obviously, uh, was about working together, finding common ground in impossible moments. Donna, is there any common ground to be found right now as you look forward, whether it be on legislation um, or any other area in Washington right now? Well, I don't know what the specific issue is, but I do think that there are enough, certainly among Democrats and enough Republicans who actually want to be legislators for those avenues to be found without knowing what precisely that would be. Look, we didn't think there was going to be bipartisanship on infrastructure, mm. on CHIPS legislation, on a whole range of things that happened over the last last couple of years. And so I don't think that we should uh, rule it out, but the politics are really difficult right now. Yeah. Yeah, going into a presidential cycle, it's hard to be optimistic that we'll find that consensus. But I think your point about Dr. King is a really important one. We ran some excerpts this morning at the dispatch of his speech on the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation mm -hmm. Proclamation. And what he did was he started the speech by talking about the important contribution to governance in a philosophical way that the founders of the United States had made and then went on to point out all the ways in which we'd fallen short of the principles that they laid out. But that was a perfect example of Dr. King saying, here's what we have in common. Now let's have a big fight about the things we need to improve on. That's a great point, Rachel. I mean, I'm very cynical these days covering the Capitol <laughs> building. But I mean, talking about the debt ceiling, I mean, there's going to have to be things they have to come together on. Yeah. I mean, obviously, last the last Congress, you know, with Democrats controlling everything, um, there were opportunities for them to get, you know, just, you know, 10 Senate Republicans on an infrastructure bill to move things. And they were very successful in that. But Kevin McCarthy is in a very different position right mm. now, and it's a very different house. And so it's going to be really tough, but they're going to have to fund the government. They're going to have to try to wait figure out to do something on the debt ceiling. Otherwise, you know, Americans are going to be really hurt by this and, and that's going to come back and hurt them. So important to keep that big yeah. picture into perspective. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great conversation, Rachel, Donna, and Stephen. Appreciate it. Coming up next, dual disasters. The federal government stepping in as both California and Alabama are dealing with devastating, deadly, severe weather events. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. President Biden approved two disaster declarations this weekend, one for Alabama, which suffered major damage after 13 tornadoes tore through the state as storms swept across the southeast late last week, killing nine people. In California, which is entering its fourth week of severe weather, the federal aid will support recovery efforts as well as help individuals in three hard hit counties, Merced, Sacramento and Santa Cruz. A series of storms caused by phenomena called atmospheric rivers have caused massive rainfall and dangerous flooding across the state, including in Felton, where the San Lorenzo River flooded parts of the town for the third time this year. The oversaturated soil also means increased risk of mud and landslides throughout the state, as captured in these really dramatic videos showing roads literally crumbling away. It is so Hard to watch that. 22 storm-related deaths have been recorded since the storms began in late December, and 7 million Californians are still under flood watches with more rain expected today. But there is some good news on the horizon. Forecasters show it will finally begin to dry out by this weekend. Joining me now from Santa Cruz County is NBC's Dana Griffin. Dana, thank you so much for joining us. Let's just start with the latest that you are seeing there on the ground. Now, Kristen, I know there's no rain happening. It's kind of been off and on all day this morning. We were getting pelted with it, but now it's gone. But that does not mean that that flood alert is still not important. That lasts until about 4 o'clock this afternoon. And there is a concern because there's still is so much water around here. And, and besides the flooding, the Ill impacts that are going to be lingering for several days is what has a lot of people concerned here. You've got this saturated ground, so there's concerns for more mudslides and also fallen trees. You know, we were near Highway 9 in Santa Cruz uh, yesterday, and there's a part of that highway that is shut down and will remain shut down for several weeks because so much heavy debris has come down that hillside, and they believe the ground below it could be compromised. So as people start to 
clean up, Kristen. The concern is also for safety because so much infrastructure here has been compromised. So people are going to really have to be safe and vigilant over these next few days. And just really quickly, Dana, where are the recovery efforts focused at this point in time? You know, it's hard to say at this point. Um, I spoke to the emergency management director yesterday, and he said that they hadn't even kind of thought that far ahead. They just wanted to get through this wet season. And once things start drying out, they're going to start assessing. I can say, though, here in Capitola, there's uh, several businesses along here that got their windows broken out. Part of the Capitola Wharf is now inside one of those restaurants. So we know that here that's going to be a focus, trying to get these businesses back up and running because, you know, tourism here is such a huge mm. industry and staying closed is not helping these businesses, Kristen. Mm. All right. Dana Griffin, who has been all over this developing story for days now. Dana, thank you so much for your reporting. Really appreciate it. For more on the impact these storms have had and the recovery that lies ahead is Monterey County Supervisor Chris Lopez. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And our thoughts are with you and your community. I know this has been a really tough time. Thank you so much. It's It's been a type of challenge that we didn't think would hit us this hard, but here we are. Well, uh, here we are. And give us a sense of what the latest is from your perspective. What are your most pressing and urgent needs right now and and how concerned are you about the flooding that remains so the blue sky you see behind me is the first patch of blue sky that we've seen today here in southern monterey county you know it takes about five days for water to work its way from the headwaters in the in the south all the way to the north and so the flooding impacts that we expect aren't immediate. we see them kind of build up over time in our community, those impacts have been real. They've been severe. And our concerns remain not just around the water itself, but what it's leaving as it recedes. We've got some water districts whose wells are not usable at this point. So we're having to truck in water for communities in my district. And we're also very cautious as this water recedes about what it leaves behind in the in terms of infrastructure. Uh, bridges are crumbling and we're very concerned about what that means as we try to get back to a sense of normal here in the coming months. Mm. And. Uh, is that your estimation that it will take months, if not longer, to get back to normal in the wake of this? Definitely months. You know, what happens is we had a significant amount of burns along our river break flooding agricultural farmland. As that happens, it actually helped the amount of water we had in the main stem of the river because that water had more places to go and reduce pressure in the main stem. Uh, that means that agricultural land is now out of production for at least about 60 days with multiple tests needed in order to clear that soil for replanting. So those impacts will continue to be felt by the workers here in Monterey County, our ag labor force, who wants to go back to work. But when you have fallow land, it means there's no crops to check on, no crops to harvest. And then in the packing houses, there's nothing to pack. So the impacts of these storms and what they've done to an estimated 25 to 30,000 acres in Monterey County will continue to reverberate for at least, in my opinion, six months to a year. And what's the status of the Salinas River? And there were obviously evacuation orders put in place. Are, are people able to get back into their homes? They are for those folks who, have, who didn't have the direct impacts. We still have homes that are being assessed, checked, tagged. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think today we're going to have the majority of not all of the Salinas River reduced to a warning rather than an order, meaning that folks can go back and check on their places. Mm -hmm. But for some folks, that's also going to be a long road to recovery. As you saw, some of the video there included homes in my district who had water uh, inside and up to a significant portion, including the video that's up now, where mm -hmm. the recovery is going to be a lot longer than just a few days. And your... Uh county estimates correct me if i'm wrong 30 million dollars in damages yeah. at least are you expecting that number to rise and where are the where's the crux of the damage that's been done so you know that number has already climbed since last night i know that we put in an estimate of agricultural damages somewhere between 40 and 45 million at this point so adding that 30 our numbers climbing and we know that those assessments need to make their way to fema and so as that happens i believe we will be added to uh, the list that you mentioned earlier of three counties I, I, there's no doubt in my mind we will shortly be on that as we continue to put in our reports and just finally your message to the state and local government are you, are you getting what you need from them 
We are. I, you know, I'm very thankful to all of our delegation, our representatives from Washington, including Zoe Locke and Jimmy Panetta in, in Sacramento with uh, Robert Rivas and Senator Caballero, as well as John Laird, who've done a great job of making sure to advocate for our communities. My message to the rest of the country is a request. You know, we're, we're going to be recovering here, and the way that you can help our workforce and help our region is to check that produce and produce markets and make sure that it's coming from the Salinas Valley. To us, that's one way you can support us as we climb out of this for the next six months to a year. You know, buy Salinas Valley produce. We, we are the salad bowl of the world. We're proud of that, and our, our food reaches everyone in the nation. And so we look forward to your support. All right, Chris Lopez, thank you so much. Please do stay safe. We will keep all of you in our thoughts. We appreciate it. After thank the break, you. more than three dozen Ukrainians were killed and at least 75 injured after a Russian missile strike on a residential building. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. The U.S. military's new expanded combat training program for Ukrainian forces is now underway with the goal of helping prepare Ukraine to take back territory from Russia. It comes as Ukraine is reeling from one of the deadliest attacks on a civilian building in months, according to Ukrainian officials. The death toll from Saturday's missile attack on an apartment building in the city central of Dnipro is now 40, including three children. Authorities also say 75 people, including 14 children, were injured in the attack and 46 others remain missing. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley has the very latest on the search and rescue operations. Well, it's our understanding that no people, no living people, have been removed from this wreckage by rescue workers for much of the past day. The last time we heard about that was yesterday on Sunday. Um, but it sounds as though, from what we're hearing from rescue workers, that they are really giving up hope of finding anyone alive in that horrific wreckage that I think you're seeing on your screen right now. You know, the fact is there was a real scramble, and it was amazing that they were able to pull some people out alive when you look at what happened there. Now, this is apparently one of the deadliest strikes on civilians ever since this war began nearly 11 months ago. And it really just goes to show that, you know, Russia has not ceased in targeting civilians and civilian infrastructure, particularly electricity systems. And that's why we've seen rolling blackouts, particularly here in Kyiv, which has really taken the brunt of a lot of these attacks. Now, you know, the Russians, we heard from the Kremlin, they said that they didn't launch this strike. They never strike civilian, uh, you know, civilian residential buildings and things like that. Uh, they implied that this might have actually been the debris falling from a missile that was intercepted by Ukrainian anti-missile systems, most of which are provided by the West. Now, that's possible, but I've been around in Kyiv and seen a lot of these debris that have fallen uh, when missiles are intercepted, and they're really quite small. They don't do the kind of damage that we saw in that apartment building in Dnipro. That just doesn't seem likely. Now, the Ukrainians have shot back and said that this is a war crime, and they know the perpetrators who did this. Back to you. Matt Bradley, thank you. Those images just horrifying. Let me now bring in Lieutenant General Steph Twitty, former Deputy Commander of U.S. European Command and an NBC News military analyst. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Good to be with you, Chris. I want to just start out by getting your reaction to that attack in Dnipro. What does it say about Russia's military strategy right now and the state of the war right now? Well, it continues to say that they don't have a strategy. Their ground forces have been defeated significantly. That's why you don't see them uh, moving to the forefront. And Russia will continue to use this strategy of terror with slinging bombs all through Ukraine, whether it be in Kyiv or whether it be at Kharkiv. Uh, they will continue this daily. And so that's their overall strategy, is to try and break the will of the Ukrainian people and as you know, the Ukrainians have shown great resilience here. And so we'll continue to see this until eventually they either run out of bombs, a, a negotiation occurs, or someone wins this fight. Well, it, as you know, Ukraine's intelligence is warning that Russia is preparing for a long-term, drawn-out war. Do you think Ukraine is ready for that? How would you compare their readiness now to when this war first began? Well, they continue to show, they being the Ukrainians, continue to show their resilience. 
I do believe the Ukrainians are ready for a long protracted war here. What we have to do in the West is to continue to uh, outfit them with the equipment that they need. And one of the things, Kristen, that uh, we need to be careful of is that the Ukrainians need equipment where they can overmatch the Russians. They need tanks, they need infantry fighting vehicles, they need attack helicopters, they need uh, air assets. If we want to overwhelm Russia and have Ukrainians win this fight, the alliance, NATO and the West, will have to pony up to provide that equipment. Well, and you take me to my next question, because General Milley told reporters uh, that the U.S. is helping with expanded training of Ukrainian forces. How critical is this moment that Ukraine gains the upper hand in key areas uh, before the spring comes, before Russia is able to retool and ramp up? Yeah, it is absolutely critical, and it's absolutely critical that we assist in this training. We're putting in Bradley Infantry fighting vehicles. It's a pretty significant modern piece of equipment in the Army arsenal. Also, the Germans are putting in infantry fighting vehicles. France, UK just announced that they're putting in, in tanks. So all this equipment will have to come with training. And that's why all this equipment's going in now, because we know after wintertime, there's going to be a huge counteroffensive. And we want to make sure that we outmatch the Russians and provide the equipment that's necessary for the Ukrainians to do their counterattack. Lieutenant General, how does this end and how you, do you get these two sides to the negotiating table? We know that uh, Erdogan has signaled he's ready to help negotiate a peace how much should the U.S. be involved in that? And, and do you see that happening right now? Is there any window? I don't see it happening uh, right now. I, I have to tell you, you got two sides here. The Russians, they are adamant that they want the southern part of uh, Ukraine uh, and the eastern part of Ukraine so they can put their land bridge in. And obviously, the Ukrainians do not want to give up their land. And so are you dealing with a case here where you have two forces that have come together that, and there's no room for negotiation. So this war is going to continue until either exhaustion occurs or everyone's dead, to be quite honest with you. So much devastation, so many lives lost already. Lieutenant General Steph Twitty, thank you for helping us to understand this very critical moment that the war is in. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, today, communities across the nation mark Martin Luther King Jr. Day with celebration and reflections. Up next, I will talk to historian Lonnie Bunch, head of the Smithsonian Institute and the founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture about Dr. King's continuing legacy. You do not want to miss this conversation. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As we honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s memory and legacy today, we can take inspiration from his own words. The day before he was assassinated, Dr. King delivered a speech in support of striking sanitation workers in Memphis. Listen. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. In those remarks, Dr. King spoke about the better days he believed would come, and he detailed the fight it would take to get there. He spoke about the commitment to nonviolence, about the right to protest, the power of financial boycotts, and about the importance of sacrificing for those in need. It's work that many Americans strive to continue in his image today. One of those we are joined by right now, Secretary of the Smithsonian and founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, Lonnie Bunch. Thank you so much for joining us on this really momentous day. We appreciate it. It is my great pleasure. Thank you. Here we are in 2023. And I don't have to tell you, but we sit here in a Washington that is very divided, facing all sorts of challenges. 
How should we think about Dr. King's legacy on this day and here in 2023? On the one hand, we should use this to really celebrate Dr. King and really the civil rights movement, all those people who believed in an America yet to be. So I think it's important to sort of take inspiration from that. But I think the other side of it is really this notion that there is still the great urgency of now, mm -hmm. that we need to recognize that what Dr. King really wanted to remind us is that the struggle for fairness, the struggle for racial equality will be an ongoing struggle as long as there's an America. Mm. And today, we always say this every day that we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King is a day on. It's not a day off. What does that mean? What should it mean to the younger generations of Americans who are just starting to learn about his life and legacy? In some ways, the notion of a day of service, of recognizing that there's something greater than you, that you can provide help to those that need it, is really important. But I think the other layer is to recognize that this is really an opportunity for younger generations to recognize that they too can change America. That drawing from the civil rights movement, these young kids who demanded America be fair and they changed America, the recognition is that younger generations now have that burden. And it is a burden and responsibility to carry forward the message that you too can make America better. When you think about the civil rights of today, you would hear a lot of people talk about voting rights, LGBTQ rights. What do you think and how do you think Dr. King would see the civil rights fight today? I think Dr. King had always seen the civil rights as broader than simply racial justice, that it was about economic justice, it was about fairness, it was about increasing who had the opportunity to do well in America. So I think he would have embraced LGBT issues. I think he would have also continued to push the economic foundations that would allow us to cross many racial lines to find that economic justice. So I think Dr. King would still be at the forefront of helping us think about how do we be more inclusive and how do we make the country better. And how should we think about him? Obviously, we think about Dr. King, we think about his message of nonviolence, but his message was more complicated than that. You're describing part of it. Some people saw him as being a radical in some ways for his time, a disruptor. What are the nuances that often get overlooked about Dr. King's legacy? I think in some ways the holiday has taken the rough edges and made them smooth, has forgotten that Dr. King demanded and confronted racial inequality. So his notion was nonviolence, but that doesn't mean you don't confront, that you don't disrupt. Um, and Dr. King never was satisfied with the status quo. And so I think that part of the legacy is that you've got to realize that he's saying challenge, challenge, challenge. But the other part of the legacy is recognizing that he felt that it was important for him to be able to embrace the totality of the American experience, that he was simply asking America to live up to its stated ideals, to demand America live up to its ideals. Mm. You know, it's notable. We were doing some research for this and realized there are two states, Alabama and Mississippi, that celebrate uh, Confederate General Robert E. Lee on this same day. What does that tell you about where we are, how far we have come since Dr. King, and how far we still have to go? It reminds us that the North won the Civil War but lost the peace. Mm -hmm. That, in essence, the fact that um, people link this to a holiday to celebrate Robert E. Lee really tells us about the ambivalence many people have. Uh, that, in essence, the fear is that if you embrace the King holiday, what you're also embracing is a tortured racial past, and you're accepting the fact that you were once a place that needed to be made better, and that that challenge is still in front of us. Mm. I wonder if you could just talk personally for a moment. You are the first African-American secretary of the Smithsonian. What did Dr. King mean to you? How does he still inform your work? In some ways, what Dr. King did was create a sense that there were many things that were possible, that rather than simply accept the status quo, that you could be different. And he inspires me every day because I recognize that I'm standing on his shoulders and shoulders of many other people. 
So in some ways, Dr. King is a North Star for me to recognize that you've got to make your institution, make your country better, because you really owe that to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Well, you inspire us, Lonnie Bunch. Thank you for sharing your reflections on this day. We really appreciate it. My great pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for being with us for this hour on this day in which we do mark the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. I am back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.